What's that? You want a bedtime story? I'll do you one better. How about this podcast? Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. I'm recording this in New York before I leave for Phoenix, but at the time of posting, I'm still in Phoenix. Hey, Phoenix Mike, how's Phoenix? Phoenix is fantastic. That's great, Phoenix Mike. How was the live show? The live show was fantastic. God, you love to hear it, Phoenix Mike. Well, if you want to go to a live show and you happen to live in Los Angeles, I'm doing a live show in Los Angeles and tickets are almost sold out. Like I said, it's a very tiny venue and we're almost gone. So if you want to see me in Los Angeles on February 14th, you can go to multitude.production slash live. We'll be doing Wizarding World The Bachelor. We just did Wizarding World The Bachelorette in Phoenix. I'm sure it was a raucous, wonderful time and the LA show will be just as good, if not better. And if you missed the announcement last week, we have new merchandise on the merch store. Kelly designed a steamed nuggets gold enamel pin that is available for pre-order. It is absolutely gorgeous. Many of you have jumped on it. I think everyone should get in on the trend as well because they're great and Kelly put a lot of work into it. So if you want to check those out and order one for you, your mom, your friends, your janitor, you can head on over to bit.ly slash merch on. Speaking of Kelly, she makes me happy. You know who else makes me happy? Our new patrons. Now, Phoenix Mike will be recording these on a lesser quality microphone. Take it away, Phoenix Mike. Thanks, Pass Mike. Shout out to Catherine Kronk, Harsimran Singh, Brett K, Sarah Ockerblom, Merv3001, Hey Hey Nebula, Hordaki, Eric Stoner, Johnny Goaty, Julia, Tim Muster, Deletta and Nakioi, Michelle Christabel, Kathleen Dunn, Suzanne Van Leeuwen, Elizabeth B, Annabelle, Aaron Miles, and Ross Mumby. A name correction for Lauren Rosas Romero. Shout out to Anna Martin, who upgraded their pledge. A huge shout out to Farzan Garabat and Melanie DeGrief, who upgraded to the producer level status, as well as our new producer producer level patron David Douglas. They joined the ranks of Vicky Aaron, Jesse Clow, Marchismo, Samantha Juan, Rose Marie, Marie, Lisa, Romina, Audra, Eleanor, Rossan, Nikita, Ali, Amelia, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Orchid, Vivian, Takari, Haley, Moster, Ingen, Alex, John, Noel, Emily, Liz, Brandon, Sarah, Claire, Rory, Gloria, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jennifer, Friday, Ivor, Naomi, Summer, Andrea, Lynn, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Toothless, Maya, Mark, Polly, Netta, Zena, Harlan, Noelia, Addie, Nikki, Kine, Amanda, Alicia, Kafir, Lindy, Sarah, Marta, Erin, Eileen, Violet, Lindsay, Keegan, Miranda, Gail, Ann, Mr. Folk, Maya, Kieran, Lily, Wire Warrior, Floor, Siri, Georgia, Peter, Skyla, Adele, Professor Threat, Ellie, Daniel, Lee, 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 Elizabeth, Michael, Tiffany, Kelly, Carrie, Connie, Mary, Jennifer, Jaden, Nedry, Will, Samantha, Kayla, Aurora, Emma, Out of Context, Marcos, Hannah, Courtney, Victoria, Marie, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, Julie, The Meadows Family, Ginny, Anna, Fake, Brianna, Jenny, Sarah, McKenna, Mary, Joy, Heather, Dead Cat Lady, Javi, Darlene, Brad, Thomas, Charlotte, Brianna, Kevin, Lori, Chrissy, Bugaboo, Jarl, Haley, Emma, Ashley, Pita, Sophie, Jack, Jen, and Nicole, Callahan, Kylo, Leah, Melissa, Jordy, Bella, Melanie, Bill, Victoria, Joe, Elizabeth, Britt, Molly, Becca, Anthony, Rees, Adam, Madison, Kyle, Don't Call Me an Infidora, G, Max, Maximilian, Sabrina, Sophia, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Who never fail to recognize that jalapenos in Arizona are much spicier than jalapenos in New York, meaning that we shouldn't have bought six of them. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus episodes, director's commentary, my notes, exclusive live streams, you can head on over to patreon.com slash potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 110 of Potterless, the first of three parts about the seventh movie in the Harry Potter film franchise, guest starring Jonas Robinett, Helen Zaltzman, and Martin Ostwick. And welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 27-year-old man who never read the Harry Potter series as a kid. He read it as an adult, and now he's watching the movies. My name is Mike Schubert. I'm that grown man, and I'm here joined by three lovely humans. Ho, <laughs> ho, Three people, one of which sitting next to me, and two of which are across the U.S., even though they're across the pond people. So let's start with the person closest to me. That's Jonas. Joe Nasty Draws from my old Vine buddy. Jonas, how's it going? It's going very well. I am excited. I am nervous. You should be. <laughs> I, I, I have British people listening to me. They're like, "This is our, this is our. What's an American book? I don't even read books. <laughs> <laughs> this is our Captain America. This is our Constitution." <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm excited to be on the podcast because um, you know I always enjoy everything that Shubes does. Oh, thank so you. I'm really happy to be on here. Oh, happy to have you Aww. and. On the line, you guys are currently in Seattle, right? That's yeah. right. You used to live here. Yeah, so we have the return guests of Helen Zaltzman and Martin Ostwick. How's it going, friends? It's such a pleasure to be back. Yeah, lovely to... Let's see how many more childhoods we can ruin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, last time you guys were on, we just talked about Peter Pettigrew masturbating himself to death. And thankfully, today, we'll be talking about movie seven. Wait, did <laughs> it really happen? 
<laughs> it didn't, <laughs> oh, but damn it. we wished it did. And of course it didn't make its way into the film adaptation. I'm so which just made this movie complete and utter rubbish. I'm imagining the guy that plays Peter Pettigrew, like, masturbating now jerking I want to see his jerk off face no because it, it's very ratty Timothy Spall's a great actor so Timothy Spall's jerk off face would be different to Peter Pettigrew's jerk off face mm, yeah. I see I, I think see. He, he would wank in character I think for me the saddest moment in the film was when Peter Pettigrew did not wank himself to death I thought that's why Tubes has chosen to have us back because of the action <laughs> replay of Peter we Pettigrew we could talk about how it, to death. how it gets translated via the special effects mm. oh yes you know whether mm. it really lives up to the, the wanking to death scene in the book and uh, we didn't, you know, we're not going to get to do that you know it's unfortunate that, that they, so, didn't, um, they didn't give us that rendition we needed I do want to say this I went to school for VFX oh. and I will say that my animator instructor was the gentleman who animated the sorting hat. What? Oh. So, I was really sure for a second, Janice, you were going to say that your dissertation piece was someone wanking themselves to death. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Not that. There's also a scene where uh, Harry gets the Marauders map from Fred and George, mm -hmm. and he's underneath the uh, the Cloak of Invisibility when they bring it to him. Yes, the, in one of the earlier films. Yeah, yeah yes. in one of the earlier movies. My compositing instructor did that shot, but he was like, they paid me all this money for no reason when they could have just shot two different shots because if you cut it, right. like there's no reason for him to be underneath the cloak of invisibility at that <laughs> point. So. Hush. Hey, take that money and yeah. run. Isn't that the famous Marauders <laughs> map where there's like two people having sex? What? Yes. Did he do the sex shot? There's like there's a. Oh uh, no, no, he did Harry underneath the uh, cloak of invisibility for no reason. Oh right, right. right. Our friend Will, who works in. Um, digital effects in the fifth film he did the bridge uh, kind of blowing up and whipping around on the thames at the beginning oh nice oh, cool yeah And I don't know anyone that does visual effects. So uh, I am idiot. out of the loop here. If you guys want to know anything visual effects, I can I can break it down. Oh, yeah. break it down real quick. Well, nice. Hopefully that happens as we talk about Bathilda turning into a snake. But before we get into that, Jonas, since you are the resident person here who has not read the books, before we get anything started, okay. what is your knowledge of the series? How far into it? Where do you fall on the spectrum uh, oh, of knowing stuff? I know a little bit of stuff. Like I, when I was listening, I listened to the podcast and then I was like, oh, wait. I have to be on an episode where I don't know anything. So I kind of stopped listening just in case I heard anything from the books. Um, but I've watched all the movies. Unfortunately, I forgot a lot of them because I was dating someone and she would get off of work at two in the morning and she's like, let's watch the Harry Potter movies. And I was like, oh, I'm very tired. <laughs> and uh, she would get upset when I would fall asleep at three in the morning to these movies. <laughs> but one of the most prominent times that i remember watching this was a uh, the cedric spoilers for an earlier movie when cedric diggory <laughs> died i was like uh he's is he dead like i was really confused because mm -hmm. it came out of nowhere and i and i see all these gifs of of um cedric diggory on tumblr at the time and i was like i felt like he was in more movies yeah, he's really just in the one. Yeah, He takes place in the third book, but he's not really in the third movie. But, I mean, he's a prominent character given in how short he lives in the series. But, yeah. yeah. Hufflepuff and proud, baby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what house are you in? Hufflepuff. Okay, good. I, I remember I, before I even took the test, I, lo I looked in the mirror. I was like, I gotta be a Hufflepuff. <laughs> oh. <laughs> See, it's not so bad, Martin. I'm not a Hufflepuff. But you are, though. I'm not. I'm no, you are, though. Not according to Pottermore. Yeah, but it's I'm wrong. A Ravenclaw. It's wrong. It was oh, no. a big heated debate. There's just last no way. <laughs> they I started something. About what, it's still going. I will say, like, getting a PhD is a pretty shoe in to be a Ravenclaw, I will say. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> yeah, but it kind of goes against all of the other grains. I mean, I identify as a Hufflepuff, but I'm obviously a Ravenclaw. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into the movie because there's going to be a lot to uncover. I actually really enjoyed this movie. Of all the ones that I have watched, which is all of them now, yeah. obviously I haven't like done the eighth in super intense detail yet, but this was my favorite out of all of them. Yeah. I think they did a very good job. And which is weird because I hear a lot of people be like, this is just people running around and hiding. What's interesting is like it might not be the most exciting part of the book. Yeah. But I think it was just the best made film adaptation for a couple of reasons. Mm. One is that they finally split a book into multiple parts, which mm -hmm. I think helped them a lot. It allows them to go more in detail and not have to skip over stuff or make things really short or hybrid things together. Although the difficulty of that is that you don't have like a, a conclusion. It just right. stops. But then also this whole book is kind of like a list of things that happen and it's like going to the next list and then there's a big fight at the end. So I enjoyed not having the big fight 
and just quite a lot of camping. Like it's very tense, lots happens. Yeah, there's a lot that goes down. I think they do a good job of conveying the emotion that I felt while reading the book. And I don't know that it's necessarily, oh, this is the best stuff that happens, so it's the best movie. I think they just, by making six ones in the past, figured out what worked and what didn't work. And then they finally split a book into multiple parts. And I think really what the shows, if anything, is that they should have split more of these into yeah. not just one movie per book because then you can go into more depth. Or skip some bits. <laughs> <laughs> or skip some bits. Um, this is before Twilight, right? Yeah. So I feel like this is a saga movie mm-hmm. that kind of like set that boundary of like the last movie should be split up. People freaked out when they were doing this. The first Twilight was 2008. 2008. So this came out before Twilight split the last book into yeah. two parts. I do remember that when they announced that book seven was going to be two movies, even as someone that wasn't a fan of the series at the time, I remember that being a big deal. People being like, what? It's going to be two (laughs) movies. How are they going to do that? Very easily. And they did (laughs) it cover less. It seemed like a bit of a cash grab when they announced it. Yeah, I think that was the general vibe is that they were people thought they were just trying to milk it for as much as they could. And I think what a lot of people said is that other books were meatier than the seventh, even though the seventh's one of the longer ones. I think six really could have been benefited by splitting into Mm. two movies. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was necessarily them going for a cash grab or anything like that. I think it was just they were such a pioneer of turning a major multi-part book series into a multi-part film series that no one realized, oh, we are allowed to make more than one movie per book. And it took them until book seven to realize that. I also really quite enjoyed it being away from the school. Yeah, yeah. It feels like they're transitioning to adulthood because they're in real life locations, particularly when they're in real London. Right. It's such a contrast. That's definitely in the early films. Some of them just feel like a set with some CGI painted on. How dare you, Martin? It feels like real forests and real streets. Well, some of it is real. Like, they did do location shoots. Well, that beach wasn't a soundstage, was it, you know, at the end? No. So it's quite quite nice to have these characters, like, in what feels like a a bigger world. But yeah, let's get into it. Let's, Let's talk about the movie itself. So at the very beginning, you get the Warner Brothers logo, classic, but this time it's very rusty. So that's a fun <laughs> twist. And then there's a bunch of strange, ominous noises happening behind, and they don't really explain what it is because you have ominous noise, ominous noise, ominous noise, and then really big, intense zoom in on Scrimger's face, like just his eyes and a little bit of his nose. Not Bill Nye's best. I think. What is going on with his accent? The it's fuck like, is that? It's like a weird sort of Welsh accent. But Whereas not there's, Welsh. There's a Welsh actor in this later who does a completely different accent. There's some very odd British. Like, is it just like the American market doesn't care? That just if you're American, you're like, yeah, it's British, it's I, fine. I think generally the accent in these films are a little hard to explain because you have Luna and her dad with Irish accents even though they live over the hill from the Weasleys who also have different accents to each other even though ostensibly they all grew up in the same place. Carry on. No, I have a... So I have a question. I'm glad that I now have British guests on because the whole time this is a (laughs) a big guessing game for me of is this person famous or are they just a British actor? Is this guy that plays (laughs) Scrimger famous or is he just a random dude? No, he's a very famous British actor. He's in uh, Love Actually. He plays a sort of of, uh, Keith Richards but type in that. Every British person's in love, actually, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> every white British person. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this accent was was strange. There were multiple times when he talks throughout the movie when he says Potter that I adore a wine because it sounded like he was saying Ponter or Porter or not Potter, but I was like, oh, that's just his accent. Maybe he doesn't know which film he's in and he has to hedge his bets. <laughs> So I'm shooting three things with this wig on today. <laughs> but yeah, it starts with a big intense zoom in and then his hair also uh, very strange. Uh. <laughs> Do you not like it? It's kind of maroon. There was a scene where I mistook it. There's a scene later on where he tips up and I was like, is that Snape? Because he's got like the same sort of like kind of raven raven wig, right? No, it's sort of dark red. Is it? Yeah, oh. it looks like hair dye. Oh, okay. Yeah, it definitely looked dyed. It looked very thin and... I don't know. It looked like 80s rocker that is on the yeah. reunion tour and still hasn't changed their haircut kind of vibe. Yes. That's that's what it's yeah. going for. <laughs> like Def Leppard is back. It's like, oh man, the bassist still hasn't gotten a haircut. <laughs> I think the costumes in this film are really, really good. Yes. But why do the wizards mostly dress like 
They're in the 70s. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of old school, especially with the people wearing working clothes. Yeah, they're dressed up. Mm-hmm. Very dressed up, very old school. Yeah. Also, I've always wondered, what year is this taking place in? This is supposed to be in the mid to late 90s. Okay. I think at this point it's like 98? I would not believe it. No one's listening to Hanson. <laughs> <laughs> always such a gripe of mine is that there's not enough cultural influence yeah. of the times. No one has slap bracelets. I yes. should have checked like if they showed any ads when they were in London. Oh, that I didn't really nice. see any. I think most of the times they're in London, it's just on the highways. No, and... they were in like the middle of like a Times Square kind of thing too. Oh, yeah, right. Piccadilly yeah. Circus. Circus. Yeah, yeah. Which, ah, is, uh, which is on Times Square basically. Yeah. Yeah. I knew that. I was late. Wait, letting you guys do it. I was checking <laughs> to see if you were really British. I appreciate. You've it. passed the test. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're going to let us back in. <laughs> <laughs> so right off the bat, in the beginning, they start showing Dudley and Vernon moving out of their house because it's not safe anymore. And that is different. In the books, that's not really a concern. I don't think they're straight up moving out of the house like for good, Mm -hmm. like they are in the movie. I think they're just supposed to go away while the escape of Harry happens. But Mm. in the movie, they've decided that the Dursleys are completely leaving. And then also the movies have decided to make Petunia likable for some reason. Yeah. Well, giving that slow zoom. Well, they have the slow zoom and then she's standing alone in her empty living room. And then Harry says something to her and she's like, you didn't lose just a mother that day. I lost a sister too. Why are we seven movies in and now we're trying to paint Petunia (laughs) as this complex character? Well, there's that weird scene a couple of minutes later where he's looking in, in his weird like under the stairs hovel like nostalgically like oh wasn't it lovely when they just fed me bread and water and shoved me under the stairs <laughs> life was so much simpler then i wonder whether they are doing a complete move including all of their large furniture because if they just weren't there you might think they were just out for the evening rather than they've had to go into witness protection or start a new life somewhere you need more visuals why didn't harry do what hermione did and obliterate right since he doesn't even like them I think probably because it would diminish the drama of uh, Hermione having to do it, which is really devastating. Yeah, also, yeah. like, do you think, do you, who's protecting them? Like, it's presumably just the Order of the Phoenix that can protect them. And why would they bother? Because Harry wouldn't really give a toss if they all got blown up or... Maybe that's the you point. Know. That's why he didn't obliterate them. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is in the book, they actually explain it. They send Daedalus Diggle and Hestia Jones, who are Order of the Phoenix members. They take the Dursleys away to safety, and they're going to get them away from Voldemort potentially attacking them. But in the movie, they're just, oh, we're moving out because yeah. it's not safe, which is very strange. And it doesn't seem like that's something the Dursleys would want to do. Yeah, where's safe? Where is safe? Like Voldemort's one in the country, basically. Well, by the yeah, end of this movie. He doesn't really give a shit about them, does he? No, no. He's just like, oh yeah, we'll they put come them to you America. Put, we put it to <laughs> witness protection and then just dump them somewhere in London and let them wander around and get uh, death eaten at some point. Yeah. I don't know. The, the movie, there's a lot of things in this movie in particular. It's something that happens throughout a lot of the series is For me, and I'm glad you're here, Jonas, because I think there's a lot of different things that, as someone who's read the books, I'm like, oh, they're going for that. I get it. But I wonder if things are confusing. For example, the little fragment of a mirror that Harry keeps looking in, Mm. yeah, that's explained in the book what all of this is. And in the movie, they're just like, Harry has a mirror, and sometimes there's a man in it. It's not part of that mirror that shows you, like what you want to see? No, it's different. Oh, okay. exactly. Okay. So it's a fragment of a mirror that Sirius gave him in the fifth book, but they also didn't put that in the fifth movie. And then Harry oh. broke it. And then eventually, as you see in the oh. movie, uh, or this is, you don't get this reveal until movie eight, actually, but the mirror is supposed to basically let you see what's on the other side of the mirror. And that's Dumbledore's brother. Oh yeah. What's his name? Aberforth. Aberforth. I'm very worried about this mirror shard because it looks like it could really give himself a nasty cut. And if he's been carrying mm-hmm. it around all this time, why hasn't he put some tape around the edges? Just wrap it in the sock. And he's like running around with it too. Mm-hmm. So. Luna even calls him out for it late in the movie. <laughs> She's like, what are you yeah. doing? That's a weird, he's <laughs> you're going to cut yourself. Nice mirror, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> the sane one is saying, why are you running around with with that mirror Luna, shard. she's uh we all need to be more like her so yes as you mentioned the scene where hermione has to obliviate her parents is absolutely crushing and i think very well done where oh, they show her being really sad the parents just go blank she disappears back to the future style yeah. out of all of the pictures i really liked it uh well, I, well i'm just confused yeah. about it. it's like there's empty picture frames now. There's a, just a picture of the dad just yeah. standing there, not smiling. The mom and the dad are not smiling in any of the pictures. And 
it's just solo pictures of them. Like, why, not even centered. They're like off to the side. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. Also, also, the ones that are just have heard, they just go like, oh, yeah, remember when we took that photograph of like an empty that's, that's what I'm saying. Wasn't that was, a nice memory? Like, There's an empty, uh, our empty kitchen. Don't know why it's there, but... We've, I guess we framed it at some point. That was when we changed our kitchen. It was a really good <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> In the book, Jonas, what they do is they explain a little bit further that Hermione implanted a memory into her parents' brain mm. that they wanted to travel to Australia on mm. vacation. It was their lifelong dream. Mm. And as part of Obliviate, they forgot that they had a daughter. So it's explained a little bit further. Whereas if you're just watching the movie, you just think that she's made them forget that Hermione exists. And then, yes, you have to think way too hard into it when you see all these <laughs> picture frames where it would just be like, okay, yeah, I took a picture of a rug and then we framed it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> An empty birthday cake? <laughs> <laughs> do they do they get their memories back at any point? I can't remember. Do they not have any friends who are like, "How's your daughter?" And they're like, mm. "I don't know." What? Right? What? Yeah. yeah, that is. We've good. never that's, had a daughter. That's why. Again, in the movie, it's a lot of things where. Oh, I see what they're going for here. But yes, just it, they never explained that they send them off to Australia, which would make more sense because then no one would know they had a daughter. Yeah. Right. right but right. then I don't understand how that still protects them because if a Death Eater comes and takes them. Hermione still knows them as her parents, and if they try to kill the parents, she's still going to be like, no, I still love them. They're still my family. I think what they're trying to get at, and this is what the half-assed explanation of Harry to Petunia is, is that they would torture the Dursleys to figure out where Harry went, mm. and Hermione's afraid that they would do the same, is that they would torture the parents okay. to know where Hermione had gone. So instead she's just trying to get them. But yeah, I just think it's not necessarily explained yeah. incredibly well in the movie. You just go, okay, I guess they don't remember her now. I also th don't think that's a good plan. I mean, I think if, if you're the sort of person that employs torture, you don't, if when that person goes like, please don't torture me, I don't know what you're talking about. You go like, okay, yeah, fine. Off you go. <laughs> like that's not how it works. Yeah. It's not a great plan. If you're a, a gang called the Deathly Hallows, uh, the, wait, Death, the Death Eaters, Eaters. Death Eaters <laughs> you're definitely going to like use these as hostages. Right. Yeah, right. So right. I don't understand. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a movie. It's a, I, Again, it's a movie about wizards. <laughs> so, <laughs> so one scene that they did add that I think is actually really nice is that when they're showing Ron in his house, they have... Arthur, his dad, working with the radio and tinkering mm -hmm. around with it, which makes sense because Arthur is noted to be obsessed with muggle yes, yeah. items and stuff. But also it gives a little more explanation to Ron fidgeting around with the radio, which does happen in the book, and he's able to fix it and make it work and all this stuff. And in the book, there's no real explanation. It's just Ron tinkers around with the radio enough, and now he can hear the broadcasts, mm. whereas now in the movie, it makes a little more sense of, oh, There's Ron's light, dad is obsessed light exposition. with it. Yeah, he maybe could have taught Ron when he was a kid, yeah. had to play around with radios, etc. Well, also, are the radios exclusively picking up wizard stations? Because later, they listen to actual music, and yet are listening to <laughs> wizard news. Yeah, so this is a difference between the book and the movie. So, in the book, the whole point of having the radio is to listen to this one specific pirate radio station called Potter Watch, where they're just just talking about these kind of news updates about what's going on with Imagine Voldemort, Imagine if Harry you Potter. if you named the podcast Potter Watch. There is one out <laughs> there, and it is not very popular. <laughs> so Ooh, someone did ouch. it, and I'm glad they got the name, there but it's okay because yes. I made the pun, and here I am, number one Harry Potter podcast boy, coming <laughs> straight in your ears. But in the book, that's the whole thing is that they're tinkering out with the mm. radio station just to find this one particular frequency. Whereas in the movie, they don't really explain. It's just kind of flipping around through different stations. And yeah, they have music at one point. And then there's things that sound like they could be muggle news broadcasts. But then other times there's these specific things because they use the radio as a semi-narrator to get across some things. Because at one point it's like, blah, 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 Severus Snape, the new headmaster of Hogwarts. What, yeah, what yeah. radio broadcast is going to be talking about that? At Hogwarts News Radio? Well, we know that this school is of disproportionate political importance. True. It is. Very true. Plus, you know, some schools actually have a radio station. That is true. That is true. My college Hogwarts had one. Hogwarts got very thick walls, though. It's not going to work. <laughs> thick and with electronics three C's. don't work in the school. <laughs> so. After all of this, they finally show the logo that says Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1, which feels like the longest they've ever gone in a movie before they show that part. Hmm. 
And then after that, they show something that I hate so much, which is the flying Death Eaters. So the way that they show Death Eaters apparating in these movies is that they fly and they have this trail of black smoke. Yeah. And what that ruins is what we'll get into later, which is that in the books, the only person who can fly is Voldemort. And when he does it in the scene where they're all disguised as Harry, everybody flips the fuck out for seven chapters. <laughs> everybody just continues like, did you see him flying? Yes, I saw him flying. I can't believe he's flying. Voldemort can fly. Whereas in the movie, it's just, oh, yeah, so can everyone else. Yeah. It's very disappointing for me. So sorry. <laughs> it's just in the book. It's so cool. JK and just, Rowling. We're coming after you. <laughs> <laughs> so they cut to the scene where they're having the big fancy death eater meeting. And Alan Rickman is Snape. He does this a lot in the movies, which is great. Just him walking really fast and determined yeah. through the gate is very fun. I just think that's a, uh alan rickman thing he just walks like that it's like you got to keep up with him (laughs) i think it's very fun the way they go through but then once he goes through the gate they show charity burbage the teacher Mm -hmm. floating above the table and oh boy it is rough it is movie Mm. wasting no time to be like hey this is not a fun one (laughs) and just the way she like goes out to like uh snape like right. we're friends and i was like what are you doing in that situation you're a double agent essentially mm-hmm. and you're just like oh my god they're gonna kill this person don't make this worse for me yeah. i already don't want to be here but then I, I gotta assume at that point when she when they kill her that he's just like okay good <laughs> <laughs> i don't have i don't have to care anymore <laughs> there's a lot of roadkill in this film human roadkill yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot going on what are snape's motivations at this point because he's sort of done his like spying for dumbledore bit but dumbledore's door is dead right yes he's also the one providing the information about harry potter's movement so he is helping voldemort at this stage does he do anything to help the order of the phoenix he does the- and you don't learn about it until later on but basically Snape in this particular instance is just trying to prove his loyalty yeah, right. to Voldemort and still trying to show that he's his right-hand man. Right. And he's intentionally trying to be correct about the Potters moving here, but the plan was that they would still Harry would get away even though they would correctly guess it, so then Snape would be 100% back in Voldemort's good graces because in the book they make it clear, but not so much in the movie that Snape at the start of the 7th book isn't 100% on Voldemort's good side. Right. Because in the book they have Yaxley who's that blonde guy in the movie with the ponytail. Yeah. Um, Played by Peter he Mullen. shows up with Snape at the same time when they're going into this Death Eater meeting. Yeah. And in the book Yaxley's like, "Oh, Severus. Yeah. Everything okay? But I don't know. Voldemort <laughs> likes you kind of thing." So it gives a bit more reason as Jealous. to why. <laughs> it gives more reason as to why Snape is trying to get back on his side. Bit of a waste of Peter Mullen, one of Britain's scariest actors. He's Terrifying. And I love the decision to play this character as a total wide boy rather than a kind of creepy uh, Snape type. What else is he in? Because he did seem very terrifying. It was a very different... I envisioned Yaxley to be very different. I imagined Yaxley to be much like the lead singer of an 80s hair band, like Poison or something. Yeah. Just like high-pitched, like, you're ready to rock voice. <laughs> but this guy was also David very Lee Roth, what, what, what other stuff has he done? Uh, he was in War Horse. Yeah. Picking, was, he, was, was he Top of the Lake? Is that Peter Yes, Mullen? in Top of the Lake. Picking stuff that you've heard of. Train spotting. Oh, train spotting. It was an episode of Westworld. Oh, good for him. Yeah, yeah he has a very classic villain look to him. So it feels like a casting. He's sense. a f- fucking terrifying performer. <laughs> yeah. Put him on more. You hear that, Hollywood? Put him on more. <laughs> he, maybe he doesn't want to. He's like busy with his bleak British films. This dinner at the Malfoys, if it is dinner, are they even eating or are they just sitting around a massive it, it, dinner They're just table? sitting around. It's one of those meetings where they should have food, but they don't. And then halfway through, everyone's mad when they realize they're not getting food, even though the meeting was at 7 p.m., which is definitely a dinner time meeting. But they've all got incredible black clothes. And do they yes. like arrange that between each other beforehand? And do they... They've just got a vibe. Do they keep the house cold so that they can all wear a lot of layers? <laughs> Both of the both. I think it's got to be a conscious choice where they don't have a uniform, but they're definitely going for 
a vibe yeah. as a team. Vibe check. They're trying to make <laughs> make sure. I do like the thought that they make it purposely cold because part of their look is having cool jackets. So yeah. oh, we have to make the room nice and cold. Bellatrix seems pretty fashion forward. I think occasionally she just turns up in like a kind of red or a blue and they're just like, no. <laughs> Take no pictures. No colors. One thing I did notice about Bellatrix in this particular scene is her hair keeps getting more and more voluminous with each movie. <laughs> and in this one, it's it's out of control. <laughs> it is very Texas-sized hair. <laughs> Texas-sized dance mom hair. It's very large. It seems too big to the point where it would start to be a hindrance when she's it may just be, walking. It may be inappropriately big. I, I don't know. It's, <laughs> I, it, it, was, it stood out to me like, ah, Bellatrix, geez, really hit the curling iron today. Do you think there's <laughs> like a, is there like a tactical reason to think she can like hide a sort of Gryffindor in there or something? Mm. Just like pop it out in case her wand gets uh, Expelliarmus. Maybe. Yeah, she could use it for extra storage of yeah. different things. Yeah. Just imagine her like in a gunfight, she's busting out a bunch of wands <laughs> <laughs> they're just all stuck up there it's like from ferris bueller when the assistant pulls a bunch of pencils out of her hair it's just wands coming out and coming out and coming out speaking of hair that's a little rough the guy playing thickness his hair situation is very bad he has a goatee with no mustache attached to it which is Ew. always a strange vibe and then very long stringy 90s hair. though it's set in the 90s there were a lot of very mannered beards in the mid to late 90s ah that's true. Okay, I can see that. Maybe that's what it was going for. I gotta, I gotta take my head out of 2019 and <laughs> realize that in '98 that might have been. You cool. were like no years old in the '90s, but it was a very <laughs> a grim time aesthetically. <laughs> yeah, you were, you were even born yet. I look. I was born in 1992, so I knew a little uh, bit of stuff. There you go. <laughs> what I a was baby. like 40 years old in 1992. <laughs> I was like, how old was I? I was like five. It's okay. 2016 was 20 years ago, so now I'm in my 40s. <laughs> <laughs> time flies. <laughs> yeah, when the world is falling apart, time just moves faster. Time may be moving faster, but we need to slow down because it's time for Wingardium Madridosa. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by BetterHelp. Let's say hypothetically that you are searching for horcruxes with your two best friends and you're not making any sort of progress and you're really stressed out. You need someone to talk to about this, but your friends aren't giving you the help that you need. You need help that is better. How are you going to get this counseling that you need, this better help? You're going to use BetterHelp. BetterHelp is the world's largest counseling service. They can assess your needs and match you with your own counselor from their network of licensed, accredited, and board-certified therapists. All adjectives I want to see in front of the word therapist. You can start communicating in under 24 hours, and it's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's counselor network, which may not be locally available in many areas, which is nice. I watched an episode of Last Week Tonight where they talked about how there's only a few counselors in certain really rural parts of the country, so BetterHelp being online can really help you out. And another aspect that is nice is flexibility. BetterHelp isn't limited to the traditional 9 to 5 of therapy. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You can schedule weekly video sessions or phone sessions, and it's really flexible. You also don't have to go to an awkward waiting room. You can get therapy from the comfort of your living room. Their mission is to provide everyone with easy, affordable, and private access to professional counseling anytime, anywhere, so you can get started today. If you're interested, as a Potterless listener, you can get 10% off your first month if you go to betterhelp.com slash Potterless. Again, that is betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Potterless to get 10% off your first month of counseling anywhere from the comfort of your own home. So go to betterhelp.com slash Potterless, save 10%, and talk to someone about your struggles with finding horcruxes today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by Stitch Fix. Let's say hypothetically that you're out camping looking for horcruxes with your best friends and your clothes are getting a little bit funky. You're going to need some fresh clothes delivered directly to you. How are you going to get these fresh clothes? You're going to use Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service that hooks you up with awesome outfits delivered directly to your door. All you got to do is fill out your style profile, answer a quiz that asks you about how you like your clothes to look and fit and feel. And a real human being from Stitch Fix will hook you up with a personalized box. I've gotten some great stuff from Stitch Fix. I have a pair of dress shoes from them that I wear all the time. Kelly's gotten a bunch of clothes, right Kelly? Mm -hmm. You like your long sleeve shirt? Oh yeah. You like that lacy top? Yep. How about that purse they gave you? Yeah. Rain boots? Uh-huh. The yellow jacket? Yep. That was everything, right? Flowery shoes. 
flowery shoes, so many good things. You can get good things too if you go to stitchfix.com slash potterless. And if you keep everything from your box, you will get an additional 25% off. So go to stitchfix.com slash potterless, create your account, fill out your profile. You can get shipments automatically or on demand, whatever you need. So stitchfix.com slash potterless. If you keep everything from your box, you'll get 25% off and you can look fresh while you look for horcruxes today. Finally, today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Shaker and Spoon. Let's say hypothetically that you are in Phoenix, Arizona for your bachelor party and you want to have some nice fancy drinks with your bachelors, but you are not adept in cocktail making. You would like someone to teach you how to do it and make it very simple. What are you going to do? You're going to use Shaker and Spoon. I've used Shaker and Spoon multiple times. I've legitimately ordered multiple boxes from them and they've been fantastic every single time. All you need to do is buy a bottle of liquor and their box that they send you makes a bunch of different drinks for that alcohol. They give you the ingredients to make four servings of three different drinks, which is really nice if you're having some people over and all the drinks are very different. I've done a box for whiskey. I've done a box for tequila. I've done a box for Amaro. They've all been delicious. And if you want to save some money in addition to getting some fancy cocktail ingredients stuff with all of the instructions of how to make them so you don't have to worry about knowing what you're doing, you are in luck because as a Potterless listener, you can get $20 off your first box if you go to shakerandspoon.com slash Potterless and sign up for a box. You'll get $20 off, which is about half off the first box, which is an incredible deal. So go to shakerandspoon.com slash Potterless, get $20 off, make some fancy drinks for your bachelors in Phoenix today. Another thing that they've done with hair to send a message here is that Lucius, who is no longer in the good graces of Voldemort because he messed up so badly in the fifth book, I like that to make him look like he's not doing so well, he has a rough five o'clock shadow situation. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, you have to look like you're not doing so hot, Lucius. You've now decided not to shave. Yes. It's a good look. He's got a strong jaw. He does. I'm loving it. Jason Isaacs. Yeah, I kind of like the very... What's the phrase? Kind of very sculpted look he has when he, you know, when he look, takes care of himself. But he's still looking hot in this movie. Mm-hmm. He plays a good villain. He does. He's such a good, delectable Lucius. He's kind of desperate in this, isn't he? Like he, you sense the yeah. feeling that he's like one fuck up from getting his whole family evaporated. Pretty much, and I think that's what makes him a really convincing actor in this. Is that in the previous movies he was just supposed to be so comically over the top evil that it's kind of funny walking around right. with a cane and hitting people and all this stuff and it's very good but then in this one he plays the way that the characters written in the book incredibly well hmm. right on board because that's exactly the vibe he's going for in the book is that he messed up really badly he's lucky to be alive and if he messes up again he's out of here and that's why in the scene where he's giving his wand over to Voldemort he looks so terrified and it's so good oh well, like Voldemort's about to like spike him in the back of the neck with it or something mm-hmm. what what does what's his fuck up why is Voldemort so annoyed with him he messed up the thing with the prophecy in book five his whole deal was that he was supposed to help Voldemort and trick Harry into handing over the prophecy so that Voldemort could understand how he could overcome the person that is fated to defeat him. Right, and right, Lucius right, right. messed up all of this. The prophecy ended up getting destroyed, so Voldemort never got to hear the other end of it, and it was supposed to be this oh, one Oh, come job. on, Voldemort, that was two books ago. Get over it. I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he also messed up in book two with the diary, the Tom Riddle diary situation mm. didn't go as planned. Oh, either, that's a big so. one, though. Because that's a Horcrux. He's got two strikes, and the third strike means you get murdered. Well, yeah. I feel I feel like strike one was like you allowed one seventh of my soul to be destroyed. I feel like I would hold a grudge about that as well. <laughs> yeah, pretty big strikes there from <laughs> Lucius. A seventh of the soul. It's a lot of it. A lot yeah. to give up. That's a big chunk. The scene where Voldemort takes the wand and then breaks the holster end of it. I guess the wand stays intact. That wasn't necessarily... That was just for fashion. Yeah. I guess Lucius just wanted to look cool. I mean, it is a really cool thing. Every time Lucius draws it out, it's like you're drawing out with an old school revolver, but then it's a wand. Yeah. I always thought it was a fun little flex for Lucius. Mm. Then you've got a scene where Voldemort, after taking this wand, is telling everyone who this floating person is over the table. And he explains that it's Charity Burbage and that she teaches muggle studies. And then he says that she even has the belief that wizards should mate with muggles. And then Bellatrix in the back goes, (laughs) It's because wizards don't fuck. (laughs) Exactly. They just magically put babies into the stomachs. Right, with wands. Um, but not flesh ones. Did you say um, stomachs, no. Jonas? So that's not how babies are made. <laughs> that's that's what? what he no. got what? from the wizard's if biology you, books. If you eat some pink marshmallows and then chew them for a little while, and then nine months <laughs> later... Are there any um, like trans or non-binary um, 
wizards slash witches because it seems very binary. The wizard what? witch thing. What you think? J.K. Rowling they, in the mid two thousands was uh, aware of this. They can barely put any people of color, so why would they do that? <laughs> Hey, Phoenix Mike here. So we recorded this in November of 2019, which is before all of the JK Rowling turf Twitter stuff went down. I just her whole Twitter thing in the intro of the who's the most interesting non-essential character episode, if you want to listen to my thoughts there. But I just wanted to preface what we're about to say in this podcast episode with some context. I think JK is, I don't know if she's confirmed anti-trans, but didn't she like retweet some turf stuff uh, or something? She follows a lot of she turfs. She follows a lot of turfs. Yeah. It is okay. unfortunate. I mean, that is a euphemism. I think it's worse than unfortunate, but this is a sidetrack. Yeah, I, I am an American boy. I know that turfs are bad. What exactly are they? Well, some people are going to be like, turf is a slur, but um, turf is, uh, it means trans exclusionary radical feminist. And it is uh, basically people who are viciously anti-trans. Okay. And Britain seems to be great at uh, cultivating them and giving them platforms. And newspaper columns. Not proud of it. Mm, that's like unfortunate. That. Is it an only Britain thing or is it worldwide and it's uh, just not as big of a deal in other places? It's just, we, we're kind of the market leader, but yeah, it's, uh, it's international. We <laughs> have like different names in the States. So. Okay. There's a lot of this kind of weird, like, oh, the Death Eaters are kind of like Nazis, aren't they? Uh, you know, yeah. stuff. And I know it's in the books, but the way... The, it does it in the film. I'm not sure it entirely lands. And I, f I feel like it's entirely like, oh, yeah, it's a fun children's film. And, and they're actual Nazis and talking about blood purity. Yeah. I don't know. But do you think they should be walking around wearing Hugo Boss just to drive <laughs> yeah, the point yeah. home? That'd be good. Rather Drink, than this, all this kind of luxury 70s goth wear. <laughs> they do little things here and there in the movies to, to make that allegory. In movie four, all of the Death Eaters wore pointy hats to very much look like the KKK, <laughs> but then they got rid of that. No. And then later on in this movie, when they are showing the anti-Muggle propaganda that the ministry is making, it is super Nazi looking. Okay. It is incredibly mm. 1930s, 40s German font. It's very much on brand. I find it quite uncomfortable. Then I was like, is this how the only way you can make kind of wasps understand depression <laughs> imagine if they thought that you were a disgusting person yeah but also when bellatrix uh, writes uh, mudblood on hermione's arm uh, en engraves it then that seemed to me like a direct link to uh, the holocaust and uh, jewish arm tattoos mm -hmm. um so yeah good times good fun kids film you know just by now the kids have grown up and they should know what nazis are because apparently now in 2019 we're not all on the same page exactly <laughs> Hey guys, it's a movie, so. <laughs> but it teaches lessons. So, Jonas, as you talked about earlier, when Charity, before she gets murdered, says, Severus, please, we're friends. Oh, crushing. Oh, yeah. Mm. Very solid. This whole movie, I think, there's a lot of scenes that are just so gut wrenching that they're very good. Yeah. This yes. is one of the first. But then something that wrenches my guts in a different way is that they show Voldemort's hand and they show his nails and his no. nails are gross. <laughs> they're really big. They look like almonds. <laughs> <laughs> but they're so big and they have so much just gunk mm. at the cuticle. Mm. I just don't understand how he seems, he seems like the type of villain that would take a lot of showers. And I don't get why he's so grimy. He's, he's an evil wizard. That's why you got to look evil to be. Right. I guess. Uh, it was gross. It was so gross. <laughs> you seem to have a very strong opinions on nail aesthetics shoes. I, I don't, it's not that. Do you take good care of your nails? Do you have a good regime? Oh no, I take horrible pushing? care of mine. I, I pick them very badly. I don't bite them, but I'll, I'll like peel them back and stuff, Ooh. which so is, is not good. Is Voldemort reflecting the character traits that you despise in yourself <laughs> and that's why you hate him? Oh shit. <laughs> shit, you found me out. Uh, my therapy session has come true. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird because his nails are, they're very large and not ripped apart and stuff. It's just they're mm. really dirty. So I don't know how you can simultaneously keep your nails in check and not bite them, chew them, clip yeah. them, whatever, but then also not clean them. What's the kind of status with Voldemort's body? Is it like is he like undead or is it like a regular body that he kind of has to wash and eat food and stuff? Or If his nose didn't grow back, what else didn't grow back? <laughs> so only got Ooh. one butt cheek. Yeah. Does he have <laughs> did he gain something? Does he have uh, 12 nipples? Who's to say? We'll uh -huh. never know cuz he's always wearing the cloak. They they talk about <laughs> now we get, know it why. Off, get it off. Get it off. 
<laughs> they talk about in the books that as he got more and more into evil magic, he started to look more and more evil. And this is this weird thing that I have a problem with JK making a lot of this a big focal point of the book is that the people that are good at magic usually look attractive and the mm. people that are evil look mm. ugly and I don't like that that's a thing I mean that's that's straight out of a Nazi playbook isn't yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> quite a lot of the Death Eaters are kind of hot. Yeah, I mean I Lucius looks great. Lucius yep. looks great, Bellatrix a very attractive woman. I mean Snape is technically a good guy but he has been acting like a bad guy. Mm -hmm. He's pretty sexy I mean but I, I don't know, I think he looks very middling Really? Whoa. I, I think I don't his hair is not doing him any favors, but it's that's the, the point of Snape is that he film. has greasy bad hair. Yeah. But they talk about Tom Riddle before being full-fledged Voldemort being super hot. And then as he gets more and more evil, he I guess starts to look more like a snake. But they don't really talk about if this is what he looked like before he died. This is just the body that he has been rebirthed into. After the fourth. Reconstituted as. Yeah. So I don't know if this is exactly where he left off before he died, but I don't know. But he doesn't have any hair of sorts. He just feels like he should be clean. I don't know. Mm. Seems like a kind of a calculated villain that would not want to just like leave grime on his fingers. But well, unless he's alas. just like a like kind of a decomposing corpse. Yeah. Maybe oh, he really, yeah. Maybe he really smells. Because not really his body. Yeah, but he smells of mud, doesn't he? Yeah, he does not look like he would smell good. He should shower more. I think it's just the skin that looks like that and it's also hard to tell because so much of this movie feels like it's in a gray green hue oh, that i don't know exactly what his skin they did tone some is really really weird color grading with this where they run in everything to look dark sure and uh with, unsaturated like, yeah yeah they're really playing around with the instagram filters on this one <laughs> i mean speaking as a british person like we don't see the sun that much that skin hue is not <laughs> uncommon in the british isles yeah we all have vitamin oh. d deficiencies for like eight <laughs> of, months of the year i mean maybe voldemort's just got rickets and that's where all of his crankiness comes from <laughs> oh god yeah i don't have that problem yes i am a person of color yeah but unrepresented in the films largely <laughs> oh. it's okay oh, sorry so sad so sad. We'll always have Kingsley Shacklebolt. <laughs> what a legend. <laughs> but they show, they they again show the mirror thing that Harry has. And I hate the way that they do it because as it's described in the book, you have this fragment of a mirror and basically very briefly, you can every now and then see an eye, like just an eye. Mm -hmm. And it's always supposed to be just a very quick blink to the point where when Harry does see this eye, he has to question whether he is actually seeing something or if he's just imagining something. And the way they do it in the movie is they just show Aberforth's face for a beat. Mm -hmm. And they do this a lot. And Harry, every time he looks at the mirror, it's just like, oh yeah, it's a mirror. Okay. <laughs> but if you saw a full ass dude's face, you'd probably say, what? Huh? Yeah. Who is this? What's happening? Ron, yeah. look at this shit. Harry is sort of used to weird shit happening though, isn't he? I Wouldn't guess, he just yeah. be blase if you're like, I've seen a flight of stairs like move from one bit of the castle to the other. I've seen portraits <laughs> moving. I play a game that's on broomsticks with absolutely pointless rules. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can believe anything. <laughs> that's very true. That's very true. So later on, we finally have all of the squad getting together. And when Ron first sees Harry, he gives Harry the big overarching hug Aww. that Hermione usually gives in the movies. And I thought that this was fun. Yeah. Ron kind of stole Hermione's signature move. Because always in the movies, it's her giving Harry this big, dramatic, lunging hug. And now Ron does it. And I think it's very fun. I enjoyed it. I think it's nice as well that they demonstrate affection for each other rather than being like handshake. Oh, hey, how's it going, man? Yeah, yeah. exactly. We're men. Cultivating diffidence. They've been through so much, though. Like, they would forge, like, stronger emotional bonds given the amount of trauma they've faced. I like it. I think that... Everyone, whether it's two dudes that are friends or any sort of mix of anything of friends, is be okay to show more affection and stuff. As soon as I walked into the door, I hugged Shubes. Yeah, Aww. it's just what you do. I hugged Shubes at the gym. We were at the gym. I hugged him. I kept mm -hmm. hugging him as he was working out, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kept I, I, saying you were spotting me. It was a little strange. No, but like I tell my buddy Johnny I love him, you know? Well, I just, I, and, and not in just like the silly way. Yeah, I think yeah. we should all be okay with showing more affection and stuff. Hey, and I yeah. like that. Ron. Hey, Shoes. Yeah. I love you. I love you too, man. I hooked Helen just the other day. Oh, there you oh, go. There you go. Look at that. Boom. Huh. Marriage. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. So this scene is part of everyone showing up to do 
the seven potters where yeah. they're all described as Harry. And when Kingsley Shackable comes in, already one of the coolest characters in the whole series, Harry says, I thought you were supposed to be watching the Buggle Prime Minister. And Kingsley just goes, you are more important, which I think is so great. I love Kingsley so much. And he's very fun here. A person of color. Look at that. Such a rarity in these films. I'm looking at the crowd for no reason. There's no crowd here. <laughs> <laughs> looking at the pillows on my sister's bed. <laughs> I thought this was a great scene because we also get to meet uh, Bill Weasley. Yes, which is a shame because you're supposed to have met him many moons ago. Yeah. He doesn't show up in the movies until now. So the first time I ever saw Bill we- Weasley mm-hmm. was on the Harry Potter ride for Gringotts. Oh, yes. So, hey, hey. So that's the, I was like, wait, that's the guy from... Uh, the guy from Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And played by Mad Eye Moody's real life son. Yeah. Whoa. So that guy and the guy who plays Mad Eye Moody, that's his dad. Really? Yeah. I really did not know. And that's actually catching me off guard. And I love that act. I forgot what that actor's name is, but I love him so much in a, in a movie called About Time. I haven't seen it. Oh. Donald Gleason. Donald, Donald Gleason. Gleason. If you yeah. if you don't want to cry, Shubes, don't watch that movie. I, I cry. I, I'm good for time. I'm down for a good movie cry. Yeah, why would you not want to cry? I'm much, I'm much more of a Brendan Gleason fan, I have to say. You can like all the Gleasons. In Bruges, <laughs> the gods. So Harry quote unquote meets Bill, even though he's already met him, and Fleur comes in, and Fleur looks 30 years old. Yeah. So I looked it up and the actress at the time was 28. I think Fleur is main is supposed to be in her early twenties at this okay. point. Because she was 17 in book four yeah. or 18 in book four. So she's wizards, supposed to be 21 or 22. It's so disturbing to me because wizards, they're kind of children, 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 children. As soon as they leave school, married, middle-aged, like from your <laughs> early 20s. It sucks. And none of them fuck. I know. <laughs> Except Neville. Yeah, Neville fucks. Oh, Neville. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's barely in this film because he's, he's busy. <laughs> so many of the wizards we learn about, they get married immediately after graduating and then they have kids right away look at tonks she is supposed to be same thing 21 22 and she's already married to lupin and pregnant enjoy your youth everybody i know like live it up that kind of coziness isn't it of the harry potter books is that like everyone has to kind of have a nice safe place in the world and there's no i guess you know characters going off on riding but dragging around europe benders for three years yeah, the lost years. But yeah, don't uh, don't wait too long. Also, yeah, uh, not, then you'll be like me. Your alone. biological clock is ticking. <laughs> <laughs> was that your Marissa Tomei impression? Oh no, that was not. <laughs> what is that? For? That's from uh, that's Looney like Marvin the Martian says yeah, it at some lo- point in Looney Tunes. Yeah, Looney Tunes. Do you guys have Looney Tunes? <laughs> yes, we have things. <laughs> <laughs> they're called what's I'm trying. They're called like. What's a what's a British way to say Looney? <laughs> Lunad tunads. <laughs> <laughs> They're the preposterous tunes. <laughs> <laughs> preposterous Sorry. melodies. That was a good one. <laughs> so Tonks shows up and she starts to reveal that she's pregnant, but they cut her off. Oh, but yeah. she does mention that she's married to Lupin, which I don't think they really get into this too much in the sixth movie, which is when this whole love interest is supposed to take place. But now that Tonks is married, she has boring hair. She just has regular person hair now. So, oh, you've settled down. You have shoulder-length <laughs> blonde hair now. See, straight to middle age. Uh, what was her hair like before? Multicolored. It was like a famous thing. It was thing. pink. Like her it hair was purple. Keep... It was ah. red when she got angry. Ah. It was like spikier and stuff. Hmm. Yeah, her trademark hair color was bubblegum pink is what her standard color yeah. is. Every now and then it would change. But yeah, now that she's married, she's like, oh, I have to. I'm 22 and I'm, I've settled. <laughs> Hey, even if you're 22 and you, and you settled, you can still have fun hair, guys. Yeah, live it up. Yeah. Uh, come on, Tonks. But then they get into the actual scene where they're all turning into Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. And this is some nightmare fuel oh, in yeah. the visual effects department, mainly because they're they're panning one by one to all the people as they slowly become Harry. And when they show the twins do it, they shrink down and then they start to change and Madunga starts to change. But then they pan to... Hermione Granger. And when they do it, Emma Watson is midway between Emma Watson Ah. and Daniel Radcliffe. And I do not like it at all. It's like the face mash uh, app thingy. Oh, it's gross. (laughs) I don't like it. Also, Daniel Radcliffe has quite a mature looking upper body for the character he's playing. Yeah. His chest hair is that of a 30 year old man. (laughs) There was, I think I saw some white hairs in there a little bit too. (laughs) He's got a full Santa bit. <laughs> he's very pale. I, I, you know, he's not afraid of it, I guess. But yeah, it does. 
it does look like the chest of a much older person than a 17 year old. They grow up so fast, these wizards. They really, as a they really do. They eventually do the escape and they're all disguised as Harry. They're flying around and stuff. And I don't know what the obsession with these movies is, but in the books, it is an important thing to have the statute of secrecy mm -hmm. where they go undetected from muggles. And every time they do some sort of transit scene in the movies, the directors always think, wouldn't it be cool if they're just on the highway fucking shit up? Yeah. <laughs> because they knock over cars. There's car accidents. Hagrid's riding on the tunnel ceiling. They flip over a caravan. I don't quite understand this plan. It doesn't seem like the best deterrent. If Harry's got a tracker on him, they're going to tell which one's Harry, surely. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, they don't know that they've got the tracker on him. So in theory, it makes sense with what they're Maybe they don't to have do. access to the tracker because isn't that something any of the Ministry of Magic's meant can't to be they, able to use? Can't they operate? Can't yeah. they do some clever wizard shit? Can't you put the fucking invisibility cloak on? I, I Jesus. Yeah, it, it's not the most well thought out plan. Mm. It's very exciting chase. Like it's very dramatic and tense. It looks right. pretty good to me, but then I'm not a visual effects expert. Right. Uh, oh, over to you. The reason why it looks good is because it's so much, there's so much going on. You can right. hide a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a lot of green screen, a lot of blurring. Yeah, I'd imagine it's like all green screen and they're not actually in the skies above London. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I just, it bothers me that they do so much destruction of the muggle world in this because it's right. supposed to be such a wizard thing that they're supposed to keep themselves yeah. secret. And they are very yeah, they turn out over the a open. caravan. Like how people could die. They knock down multiple how do you power lines and all this stuff. Yeah, they let a pylons blow up. So are the muggles now are like they're like, oh, there is magic in this world. Yeah. So what happens in the books is that you're supposed to have the statute of secrecy. And as Voldemort is being evil and destroying things. There's scenes in the books where he destroys a bridge with a bunch of muggles on it. It's a struggle between the muggle prime minister and the wizarding prime minister to come up with explanations for what all these so, disasters are. So the muggle prime minister knows. Yes. Okay. The muggle prime minister knows and they work with the wizarding one to figure out how they're going to twist things so that they don't know about magic and wizards because if they're to find out that a wizard Hitler exists, it's going to be bad news. Yeah. But in the movies, they don't really address that at yeah. all and it doesn't really make any sense. This is a very like very comic book X-Men kind of thing where yeah. mutants are so powerful, but yet they are underground and hidden from this mm -hmm. world. Because they get persecuted. Yeah. And it's the same thing with these wizards. Mm -hmm. It's just like you're more powerful than these muggles, obviously. Yeah. I don't know. We never get any sense of any consequences of them revealing themselves. Like presumably, yeah. like, I don't know, like if a tank rolled over a wizard, the tank would win, you know? So... If the Muggles of, of Britain decided to send the army against Voldemort, like they'd probably stand a decent chance, right? But they yeah. just don't want that to happen for, for I, I, what I, reason? I mean, what eventually put the wizards into hiding is that there were fewer of them and the Muggles were persecuting them. So they went into hiding. Right, but in the circumstance where it's Voldemort or you enlist the help of the Muggles, wouldn't you just be like, yeah, we're going to need a few Air Force jets and stuff because this guy's bad news. Yeah, I mean, Voldemort's incredibly powerful and he seems to just not care at all about any sort of destruction or letting it be known that wizards are back because I think in his dream world, wizards take over everything and he yeah. thinks all muggles are worthless so who cares if muggles start finding out that wizards exist? Yeah. They should fear me anyway. I'm Voldemort. Yeah. I still think that's a decent chance. A few F-16s against Voldemort. I'd put my money on the, on the uh, fighter jets. Top Gun 3. <laughs> that would be an amazing crossover. Ooh. Maverick versus Voldemort. <laughs> Just imagine Tom Cruise in a Harry Potter movie. That'd be great. Just sprinting. Yes. And then getting in. Oh, I would love it. I would love it. Give me a, a remix of Hedwig's theme by Kenny Loggins. <laughs> I'm on board. Also, during that scene, rest in peace, Hedwig? Yeah, Hedwig dies. Oh. This is a, a difference between book and movie. In the books, it's just your standard Harry has his stuff that he's supposed to be yeah. bringing out of the Dursley's house and Hedwig is just there. Yeah. So in the books, Hedwig is just in a cage yeah. in the sidecar of the motorcycle, which makes it even more painfully obvious which one is Harry. So in the book, this makes even less sense. Yes. <laughs> and in the book, Hedwig just gets caught in the crossfire and dies at one point the cage is falling out of the motorcycle harry grabs it and then hedwig gets shot with a, a vodka Kedavra. so 
in the book is just kind of supposed to be the shock value and it's a symbolism for Harry's childhood innocence dying now that he's leaving yeah. he's become of mm-hmm. wizarding adult age all this other stuff and it's heartbreaking yeah but in the movie they decided to make Hedwig go out like a champion yeah. which I guess is fine bloody hero but I don't understand it didn't seem necessary well, but I, it's fine yeah but I think they're just uh, they're really piling on uh, yeah. all the people and things that and owls that have given their lives to save <laughs> Harry and he, and he feels it even though everyone else is like Harry don't worry about it it's fine and he's like no it's not fine yeah they're just trying to make you feel more and more what Harry because his big thing is I'm sick of everyone sacrificing themselves for me and he gets in a fight with Ron about it etc yeah. yeah exactly so they're all flying away Voldemort starts flying as I mentioned earlier it gets completely ruined because there's no cool effect of it and then a difference between the plan in the books and the movies is that in the books the plan is that they're all going to different houses mm-hmm. and then they're going to use port keys to go to the borough all together yeah in the movie, it just seems like they're all going to fly away and arrive at the burrow at different times. Yeah. Regardless, they cut to Molly at the burrow and she's washing dishes, which doesn't seem like this is the appropriate time to be doing chores. Maybe yeah. you could say this is her freaking out about her children being out there. So I got to keep my mind busy yeah. and, and yeah. get out of my internal thoughts. But I did find it very strange that they cut to Molly calmly washing dishes. But she's also like... When Harry arrives and when George arrives injured, she's just very like, oh, my boy, my sweet son, and like lays him down. It's George, right? Yes. Okay. yes. And like lays him down when he's obviously really injured. Right. And she's very calm during the situation. Like, my mom. She's just stroking out. his head. She's not fucking helping. <laughs> she's not trying to seal the wound. Like, I thought she was meant to be like quite a healing person, but she's she just is. like. She's supposed to be a really good healer, and that's why it's supposed to be shocking when she's unable to to heal his ear. But yeah, the vibe that I got in the book is that Molly was much more on top of it and part of the plan. She was the person already at the borough, making sure everybody arrives safely. And in the book, it feels like she's more on top of the ball. And in the movie, it's just like, oh, I'm Molly, I'm here, which I think is a disservice to her. It just seems like, oh, she's the mom. She's going to stay home and do chores. It almost felt like she didn't know they were coming when they they first arrived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like she was surprised that they were there. Yeah. Maybe it could be she was surprised they were there so early because the plan was supposed to go longer and yeah. it, they had to abort the mission because all the Death Eaters showed up. Maybe that's it. But I don't know. I think they downplayed Molly's power yeah. and prowess as a witch here yeah. a little bit. So then you've got the Hagrid Harry crash, which is done a little bit differently with when Hagrid passes out and for how long he's passed out mm-hmm. and with Voldemort coming and then Harry's wand attacking. But the vibe is basically the same. You're just supposed to get the understanding that Harry's wand, without Harry really controlling it, fought against Voldemort. Yeah. And it's this big sticking point of how did my wand do this? Why did my wand do this? Yeah. That kind of sentiment is lost in the movie because Harry doubts himself a lot mm-hmm. with, oh, I didn't even do anything. It was just my wand. Yeah. But I don't know. What's the ex- explanation for that meant to be that they chose similar ones because of their link? It's they have the same core of the wand. It's right. both yeah. feathers from the same phoenix. So, yes. And, and the, the later wand reveal. chose the wizard similarly because they have this this link that was formed when uh, Voldemort's curse rebounded. Yes, so that is part of it, and then there's part of Voldemort inherently inside of Harry, but then another thing that you don't learn until later in the seventh, what would be in movie eight, is that when Voldemort used Harry's blood to help him come back to life in the fourth book, now you've got some of Harry's blood inside of Voldemort, and thus some of Lily's protection Mm. charm inside of Voldemort, so it's this multiple layer thing where the wand cores are twins, so they naturally want to defend itself but then also the wand that harry has is inherently protecting itself because if voldemort kills harry because of the blood thing and the horcrux that's inside harry it's technically hurting himself Mm -hmm. so it's a it's one of those if you think about it too much your brain explodes but basically there's a lot of connection between harry and voldemort yeah and that makes their wands want to protect each other slash fight each other okay (laughs) but don't you think that wizards would be breaking or losing their wands pretty frequently? Yes. Given how often people drop their phones in the toilet or smash them. <laughs> yeah. well, I think you can drop your wand in a toilet without it not working. It's not like there's delicate electronics. You have to put it in a bag of rice still. <laughs> I mean, you might want to yeah clean some of the piss off it before you use it <laughs> in a tournament. But <laughs> Yeah, I feel like breaking your wand in 
mundane ways should happen more often. It's a piece of wood. So yeah. Like if I see yeah. them also put it in their back pockets a lot. Right. And they sit on their butts mm. a lot. So. <laughs> and and also other wizards could easily break it, couldn't they? Yeah. I mean, it just seems like it, it's not the sturdiest of objects. And also they're always wearing robes and those feel like those have big pockets. I feel like you would leave a wand in a pocket all the time. It's like losing an AirPod at this point. Yeah. Anyone who's bought them has <laughs> had to have lost <laughs> one. I had uh, an amazing experience at an Apple Genius bar a few months ago when I was going in to get my phone unsmashed and uh, the guy next to me, he was like I've got two halves of two sets of AirPods the dog ate half of two pairs <laughs> <laughs> what a liability dog would eat wands in Wizarding World also oh that would, yeah my dog ate my wand I couldn't do my homework Professor McGonagall there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so after they crash and all show up at the burrow and everybody starts freaking out, you get Lupin interrogating Harry, which has a little bit of a continuity error because the question that he asks him is something that was never shown in the movie, but was shown in the books where he asks what was the first creature that was seen in my yeah. classroom. They never actually do that in the third movie, but I guess you could assume right. it just happened and they didn't show us. But that's always something that I thought was kind of fun. But then something that's interesting is when Ron, who is still disguised as Harry, comes back. Hermione gives Ron the trademark big hug that she always gives Harry. Yeah. But then once she does, he starts transforming back into Ron. And it's a very on-brand representation of the semi-love triangle yeah. friendship thing that's going on. Uh, but then I do love that Harry runs in and gives the awkward third wheel hug yeah. on top of it. Because <laughs> Harry's done yeah. this a couple Dude. of times in the movie so far where he does a weird third wheel thing, and I think it's great. He really fucks this moment, doesn't he? Yeah. So <laughs> is one of the Weasley twins a really bad actor? I remember thinking this earlier in the film, and I can't work out which one it is, but it might be one who delivers that really awful joke about the, Saint. So the one playing George. Feeling Saint. Yeah, I guess saint -like. so. Yeah, I like... And that, it's not a good joke, but he does not sell it. You can't sell that. That's like selling someone your phone that stinks of piss and doesn't work. That joke. <laughs> the point is that it's supposed to be a really, really bad joke. Yeah, yeah, but it's not like funny like a bad joke should be funny if you're gonna bother. <sighs> yeah, I don't want to put this one on the actor. I want to put this one on JK because even when I read this one, it's not even a dad joke. No. It's just a weird pull. Yeah. Well, it's my dad's jokes because his puns tend to be a few steps away from what uh, yeah, would be the rational kind of pun. Based on the puns I've heard you explain via the illusionist, <laughs> I would agree with your statement. <laughs> it's uh, it's rough. His wedding speech was very unusual at my wedding. <laughs> I wish. Is there a recording of it? I don't know. It's too dangerous, really. <laughs> Well, it'll just have to live in infamy forever. Yeah. Puns, man. Your favorite. Mm. <laughs> but to be fair, he does have some kind of nasty injury. Yeah, I just noticed his actor delivering lines earlier in the film when I'm just like, he seems only just able to speak. And he, did he get cast because he had a twin? I uh, That could be part of it. To be fair, I haven't seen either of them in anything major. Yeah. Oh, wait, they're from uh, they're from Sutton Coalfield. That means nothing to Americans, it's, uh, Martin. Bring it's it in. in Birmingham. It's close, to, it's close to where I was born. They don't give a shit, Martin. Yeah, really close. What kind of town is it? What should I assume about them? Uh, it's. I think Sutton Coalfield is meant to be quite posh. I would grew up in a less... Uh, I was born in a less posh part of Birmingham, but uh -huh. uh, I think it's quite... I think it's quite fancy. Did you Ooh, guys have school boys. rivalries? Well, I only lived, lived there till I was like five, so I, I didn't get a chance to uh -huh. develop the full rivalry. Yeah. It's okay. The British listeners out there are like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sutton Coalfield. Sutton Coalfield. <laughs> One way to tell James and Oliver Phelps apart is by the mole on the right side of Oliver's neck. James doesn't have one. Also, <gasps> Oliver is 13 minutes older, so that should help you pick them apart. Why? Because he just looks that bit more aged. Yeah. Right, -o. You look like you're 27 years and 13 minutes old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Oh, but the other one has two collies. <laughs> And goldfish. <laughs> so, and his favorite golfer is Sergio Garcia. And that's how you could really tell them apart is by the goldfish. Absolutely. How many goldfish have you got? Two. That's how. <laughs> oh, classic Oliver. <laughs> There's also a real problem with this kind of uh, the challenges they give each other, right? When it's like, what? Well, what was the book behind my head when I was? telling you a story about eggs and you it's can like fucking remember trivial detail well, when it, you're stressed yeah but the other person answers so if the other person is the is like legit but the person asking the question has got polyjuice potion 
they just have to go like, yeah, that's the right answer. Yeah, sure, I remember that. I, and they couldn't oh. bullshit it. I have Polyjuice questions from this film. Uh-huh. So, firstly, it seems to wear off at different times. So are we to assume that there's some kind of like metabolism thing or BMI or is it just they take slightly different sizes of dose? I think it's that in the movie they make it go away at the perfectly convenient moment. Yeah. That's thoughtful of the potion. Maybe they encode that in the spell. Yeah. In the book I think it's usually set for a set duration like 30 minutes or an hour. Yeah. So I think in the movie they're just trying to do the effect. The other thing that they change about movie to book is that in the books your voice also changes and in the movie your voice does not change. Yeah. Yes. Which seems to be a huge flaw in the whole polyjuice system to me because your voice is quite a noticeable character. Yes. Mm. Like later on when you're in the ministry and the guy's talking to his wife when Ron is disguised as (laughs) Reg Cattermole and she just starts making out with him then doesn't realize, oh yeah, you sounded like a completely different person. Why do you sound like a 17-year-old boy, Reg? It's uh, been so nice to be married to you you these last 25 years. (laughs) Who's the one that uh, Harry turns into? Oh, he turns into someone named Albert Rumcorn. He has a great Scottish voice. And I would really, I I love hearing his voice whenever I see him in movies. Oh, the actor that plays him? Yeah. But, you know. Yeah, I guess the movies just do the voice things so that you can know, like, oh, right, that's Hermione disguised as this person to make it easier. Because when you're reading the book, you have the narrator telling you, this is wrong. Oh, this yeah. Is wrong. Right, this right. is Harry. Yeah, that's, a so, good, that's a good decision. Yeah. I think it's just I'll to make it, it easier on the children watching it. Right. It makes it easier for these kids. But you're right. It does, like, strategically not make a lot of sense when you're trying to sneak around to someone and you sound like you're Harry Potter. Yeah. And no one questions you when your voice is very different from what it's supposed to be. <laughs> But anyway, George has the injury, everybody freaks out, and then Harry starts to run away, grabs a backpack, and is like, I'm out of here. Too many people have fallen because they talk about Moody dying. He has had it. And the scene between Ron and Harry arguing is actually really nice. I thought it was really powerful. I think Rupert Grint really steps it up in this movie. Yeah. And I really enjoyed the little back and forth between Harry and Ron here. Yeah. Yeah. It was the, it was, I feel like it was the most believable. I think later in the film, they really ramp up these like ca- tensions between characters like slightly arbitrarily. Mm-hmm. But in this one, it feels like it's quite nice where Harry puts down the rucksack, but he's still not really facing Ron. So he's still like, yeah, you're right, but I don't want to admit it. There's some quite nice, like, just little, just like, just little bit of character work. Yeah. yeah, I do think Ron is the MVP of these three grown-up child actors in this film. Yes, I would agree. I think I, I think Daniel Radcliffe shows a lot of chops too, but I think Rupert does some very convincing work as Ron in this one. Yeah, compared to like the movies previous, he's stepping it up in this. Yeah. One. I I do think as a whole, all three of them got a lot better as the movies go on. As I've been watching them, they really start to come into their own. Yeah. And I've seen Daniel Radcliffe and stuff since, and he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that he didn't really fizzle out. Yeah. But yeah, I really enjoyed the scene. And we're getting a little bit far on the recording. So this will be the conclusion of part one of undetermined number of parts of... (laughs) We are talking about the discussion lot. of Harry Potter and the Deathly so Hallows. So we're three minutes one. into this film. <laughs> <laughs> the first one always is the shortest because we spend so much time talking about general thoughts in the beginning. But uh, Jonas and Helen and Martin, thank you all so much for joining on. Uh, Helen and Martin, if people want to find you on the internet, where can they find you? Well, uh, I have three podcasts. One of oh. them is The Illusionist at theillusionist.org. One of them is Answer Me This at answermethispodcast.com. And one of them is a new one that I started as a result of being on Potterless <gasps> before. It's a recap show of Veronica Mars called Veronica Mars Investigations. Oh, and that's nice. at vmipod.com. So that is your fault. Good. I'm excited to eventually, when your podcast blows up and gets a movie deal, uh, sue you for IP <laughs> and get percentages yeah, in go. court. I think probably if there's anyone suing us for IP, it will be the TV show that we are playing <laughs> clips true. of. Very true. After Kristen Bell takes all of your money, I'll take 10% of whatever's left. Can you just get it straight from Kristen Bell? Just so it would save me some admin. Oh yeah, and then I'd get to talk to Kristen Bell. That yeah. works. Okay, deal. You've we'll got yourself a her. deal. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Martin? Uh, I do a Tom Waits recap podcast <laughs> uh, where I talk about every Tom Waits episode or otherwise known as song uh, song by song and it's called song by song and it's song by song podcast.com and i make music uh, under the name pale bird and you can find that at palebirdmusic.com yeah what about you jonas you can find me at jonasty draws with a z at the end on all social <laughs> medias 
Um, really good. I uh, have a lot of art on there. I'm, I'm trying to get back into drawing. I took a, I took some time out, but because I've just been busy with work. But I've also have two podcasts. Uh-huh. Uh, one called Rough Night Movie Podcast, uh, where we talk about bad movie franchises. Mm-hmm. I uh, was on a Halloween episode, that, which we <laughs> man, that was a wild film. It had Buster Rhymes in it and everything. Yes, and I am also part of a podcast with another. A uh, friend of this show, mm-hmm. uh, Rex Testarossa, called The Universe According to Rex and Jonas, where we talk about really nerdy shit on there. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, and Shubes had said he has been on that episode, which was a great episode. And uh, one of my favorites, just because I love the movie that we talked about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Break into Electric Boogaloo. Yes. What a time. What a time. So <laughs> all of you lovely guests, thank you so much for being on. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say, in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, before they make a very bad joke about losing an ear. Wizard, Wizard on! on! I often get emails and DMs from people saying that they are in the process of starting a podcast or they've already started one and they need some help and advice. Multitude has a bunch of free resources, some of which that I've worked on over at multitude.production slash resources. Anytime we do anything for a convention, we post it up there for free. So check it on out at multitude.production slash resources. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Jesse Horgan, Klaus, Lopu, Marchismo, Samantha Rose, Ponce, Anfilio, Rosemary Dodge, Marie, Lisa C. Keen, Romina Rivadonier, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Ross Ann Batamon, Nikita Power, Ali Madsen, Amelia Krauss, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Orca Grower, Vivian, the Owl, Takari, Ron, Haley Hastings, Moster, Ingen, Oddstotter, Alex Consulver, John Codker, Noel Basile, Emily Tyrell, Liz Bigelow, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Ensign, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillum, Veronica Bartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer Marklu, Friday J. Svensson, Ivor Peterson, Naomi Guglielmo, Summer Rathel, Andrea Crock, Lynn Walker, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Parrish, Toothless Walnut, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Ned Atabani, Zena Rosnowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia, Addy, Nikki Harris, Kine, Amanda Alfred, Alicia McLaren, Kafir Shalt- TL, Lindy Placky, Sarah Shedder, Marta Morrison, Aaron Richter, Eileen Gazesh, Violet Sullivan, Lindsay Towning, Keegan Curran, Miranda Manning, Gail Ann, Mr. Folk, Maya, Kieran, Lily Leader Williams, Wire Warrior 4976, Floor Sake, Siri Scars, Ford, Georgia, Peter Wyckoff, Skylar Lily, Adele Ryan, Professor Threat, Ellie Hoskovchova, Daniel Fulkerson, Lee Leedley, Elizabeth Christofferson, Michael David Yordi, Tiffany Cottrell, Kelly O'Till, Carrie Krempler, Connie Bienkowski, Mary Mateel, Jennifer Wendt, Jaden Allman, Nedry OS, Will Huser, Samantha Lenz, Kayla M. Simino, Aurora Fruhoff, Emma Clark, Out of Context 69, Marco Cepeda, Hannah Zeters, Cordy Spilker, Victoria McCormick, Marie Rieger, Ashton Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Phelan, Julie Walton, The Meadows Family, Ginny from the Block, Anna Penalber, Alvarez, Fake Valentine, Brianna Jordan, Jenny, Sarah Saunders, McKenna Tweedy, Mary Joy Moi, Heather, Weekend of Dead Cat Ladies, Javi Guadalupe, Trejo the Third, Darlene Kerr, Brad Harding, Thomas Chavara, Charlotte, Brianna Cusimano, Kevin Stewart, Lori McDonald, Chrissy Tew, Bugaboo, Jarl Sviven, Haley Logan, Emma, Ashley Enstrom, Peter McGrath, Sophie Duda, Jack McMahon, Jen and Rose Dab, Nicole Linzer, Callahan and Darius, Kylo the Husky, Leah Reed, Melissa Robb, Jordy Wright, Bella Barlack, Melanie Demi, Bill Gill, Victoria Colca Perry, Joe Radwan, Elizabeth Yu, Britt McLean, Molly Bautista, Becca Spry, Anthony Rees Dignan, Adam Graham, Joseph Torp, Courtney Harris, T Run Money, Madison Kyle, Don't Call Me Nymphadora, G, Maximilian Vos, Sabrina Balsiger, Sophia Loves Pigs, Farzan Garabat, Melanie DeGrief, David Douglas, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter? Web design by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campomanis. If you want to find us on social media, you can at facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, instagram.com slash potterless podcast, and reddit.com slash r slash potterless. For all information about the show, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com. For bonus content, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. And for merch, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com slash merch. If you want to see me live in Los Angeles, you can go to multitude.production slash live. If you want to tell someone about the show, whether it's in person or through a review online, that really does help. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on. Wizard on.